taken from the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not regretfully, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad. He gives to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Uh, in Pastor Lee's uh, absence, uh, he asked that some of us share a reflection. And so um, I agreed to do that. And my reflection sort of recently, um, over the summer, I guess, has been really one that started out as something very practical. Um, during the summer, some of us were sitting over in uh, Brady Hall after um, the service, and uh, we were just chatting about Pastor Lee's new position, one that would take him away from us on some Sundays. And I ask a couple of questions about that because I know his schedule is uh, very hectic. He manages a, a couple of jobs. And uh, I asked some questions about that. And then when we had a council meeting uh, a couple of weeks later, um, so our council of Ken and our moderator, Jonathan and uh, Serena were there and many others because it's always an open meeting. Um, we again were talking about practical things, about really the running of the church. How do we make all this work? And many of the things that were mentioned in that meeting sort of stuck with me. Uh, one of them was kind of just a review of the financial spreadsheets that we always have. And then over the last few uh, weeks, after our service here, we've had some conversations led by Pastor Lee um, about things we kind of like about church um, or we don't like, we found out that some of us like certain um, church holidays and some of us don't like them so much or, or how we really felt about all these things. So one of the things that I gathered from those that we, all of us really came from very different experiences, uh, different religious experiences. And our views about that were very broad. But what came out is really the very deep connection we have here. Um, even though we came from all those different places, I think we all feel very connected. So when I now think more generally about church, and especially us as church, I think about what we give and receive from each other. In so many ways, we believe um, we act as we believe Jesus would have envisioned. We experience because of what God has created in and given to each of us, love, grace, peace, joy. We seek healing. We seek God's presence, justice, learning, community, and we experience those things here. As we gather in this space, we're able to have moments of quiet reflection, praise God in song. We find unity in being the body of Christ. We share our prayers with each other as we lift them to God. We want to grow and expand um, to share what we have. Uh, this place and people are our vision and our mission. We enjoy the leadership and support of Pastor Lee, and I feel like we have more than our share, maybe, of spiritual guides and a bench of congregant pastors, lay members, um, 
talented musicians, artists. Um, we have an enormous bounty here. Scripture tells us that God, will, as Isla read, God will always provide us with the means to be generous. Um, he gives our time, our talents, energy, our finances. And I know that God does not wait to provide for me. I shouldn't wait to provide for others, to provide for our mission here. The, the mission to create a loving, inclusive, inclusive congregation and a place for anyone to seek and feel God, a place of true hospitality. I also know there's a real practical side of this, and I'm, I tend to sort of be a real practical person, uh, very linear and pragmatic about things. And so I know that having been on the church council in the past, um, when there's a need at the church, we move our focus in an effort to meet the need. Just as over the next few weeks, we'll be working together to fill bags of love for Nora and the CIW, CIM outreach. We put our heads together when the major facility repairs are essential. Um, but at times, the smallness of our congregation is also a challenge. So I'd like to share some of my thoughts as we sort of plan our calendar uh, for next year and how we move forward. And um, I've shared these in parts uh, with our church council and with others of you. Um, but I learned a great deal um, being the secretary uh, on the church council for five or six years. I had never had a role like that at a church before. Um, and so um, it was a little bit, at, certainly at the beginning, a challenge, but I also found um, it very rewarding to serve that way. And what I've learned, um, because Ken is meticulous in his spreadsheets, is that we have always existed really on the thinnest of financial margins. Uh, we operated in the red using savings every year. And then during COVID, we lost our rental income. Um, so just as we felt we were making really good progress, COVID hit and um, it was a real struggle at that time. But uh, during that time, we continued to meet at a, as a church on Zoom. We learned a lot about technology. Um, Reverend Lee continued to lead us and we kept us together as we were apart. And in fact, some of you joined us uh, initially on Zoom. We didn't meet uh, in person for um, sometime months or a year. Um, also during my six years, it became obvious in looking at those regular budget updates that um, though our pastor has been here for 10 years, his salary is still the same as it was 10 years ago, eight years ago. And that really kind of weighed on me. Um, and I know it's been a concern to others. And I'd really like to suggest a change as we plan our budget for next year. But I also know I have this real practical side of me that we can't do that unless we practice financial stewardship. And right now we're entering into a season of uh, stewardship. Um, and in the church, what that means, stewardship in the church means to me is that God brings into our life so much, um, the natural world around us, um, the animals and the plants we live in and live off of. Um, he gives us time, individual skills and talents. Um, we're blessed um, with our finances, with the friends we have around us. And for all of that, God asks that we share those things. And that for us as a church, it means contributing to a congregation of believers, of believers that this place provides for us. I believe um, that and I have reflected on this probably more than many things um, that I've heard at church, that 
though I know this, and I've known this for a couple of years, I kind of keep waiting to do something, to do something that I feel is the right thing. I kind of wait for the right time. Um, I've sort of lacked some urgency um, in bringing the subject up and urgency maybe out of a fear of giving, anxiety about personal finances. Um, so the action waits. And I've considered to think about this many times uh, over the summer, especially. And I realized that when I'm reluctant or I'm waiting to give, I am missing out on the chance to bless others. And then I'm sort of, I find myself caught in a dilemma, you know, another human dilemma. Huh? Um, and that's not what I want to do. I always want to take what God has given me and share it with others and hope they find a blessing out of that. God has never waited to provide. Um, I know I have talents and skills and time and energy and finances that I shouldn't wait to provide to others. And I'm not fearful that God won't provide for me in the future. So I know I will always have something to share. So in this time, in this season, in the next few weeks, when we think of this time about personal, what personal stewardship is for us and what personal stewardship is when we apply it to our church, to our congregation here, um, I would hope that you would take a moment to reflect, meditate on the generosity that has been extended to you, the gifts that God has given to you, whatever they be. And whenever an opportunity presents itself, maybe don't be so much like me, uh, don't wait, don't have, you know, sort of lack that sense of urgency, that instead act and give with a cheerful spirit. So one of the things I'm praying for this stewardship spirit is sort of urgency for myself, that I don't hesitate, that I actually take the action. And I pray that each of you uh, will share uh, with me or join with me in sharing your blessings because each of you provide blessings to me on a weekly basis. So I'm going to ask that I close my reflection with a little prayer together, a prayer I'll share with you and for you. And I want to thank God for all of the blessings you have given me. I want to live a life that honors you and is generous with what I have. Guide me to opportunities where I can fulfill others' needs with my time, my energy, and my finances. Help me to serve those around me with a generous heart, a heart that reflects your nature. In Jesus' name. Join me in prayer. Lord God, may the words that I speak and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Here's a little story about how God provides. A few years ago, I heard about the plight of our monarch butterflies. I heard that their populations were diminishing to the point that they were uh, potentially facing extinction. And there was a wide appeal all over the country, but especially in Southern California, to grow milkweeds. And I thought, oh, well, this is something I can do. That can't be hard. I've got a lot of space. And I went down to the nursery and it was the wrong season for milkweed. I, I had no idea what milkweed looked like. And I asked the, the guy at the nursery and he said, well, do you want the tropical or do you want the, um, uh, the native kind and you know you also have to think about what pollinators do you want and what nectaring sources because they've got to have and it just it just boggled my mind it, it just became this big complex thing with a lot of decision making that I had to do I'm not good at decision making I certainly am not good at gardening 
So I that desire to to help the butterflies and to have a butterfly garden just kind of got put on the back burner and, and, and I forgot about it. And I would lament every time uh, I'd see a monarch. Anyway, so last year around uh, the end of July, no, end of June, Bob was clipping this what he thought was a very pretty weed that would flower every now and again. And, there, and then it looked like the bugs had eaten a part of it. So he trimmed that and he put it on the counter. Um, and I, I was busy doing something. And I is something on that little dead piece of um, leaf caught my attention. And it, it looked like a little grain of rice, a green grain of rice that was moving. And I thought, what on earth is that? So something occurred to me that I'd seen this monarch butterfly flitting around our garden a, a few days or a week before. I got the magnifying glass out and I looked at it and sure enough, it was this tiny little worm. And I, I ran up to Bob with this dried piece of plant and I said, do you think this is a monarch caterpillar? And he didn't know. And so then I looked it up on the internet and, and sure enough, the, the little picture that popped up was exactly what was in my hand. And I thought, wow, and we rushed out to the, and I said, that isn't a weed, that's a milkweed. We actually have this huge milkweed. And then I started seeing all these like little green rice fragments, you know, and I, I got so excited and I thought, God, you know, you knew this desire, this tiny little desire in my heart um, to give in this way, to, to make a difference. And you just went and did it. You grew this weed and somehow Bob has been nurturing it. And now, and so I started rescuing them because there are a lot of birds in our garden. And I thought, oh, no, 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 we, we are on a mission now. So we got the um, terrarium on the dining room table and we filled it with these branches and these little things grew and were munching and it was just all wonderful until they started getting bigger and they have voracious appetites. And then, you know, the plant was totally decimated. So we ran down to the nursery and bought buckets of milkweed and they would just go through it. And I kept rescuing more and more caterpillars. And suddenly there were like 25 caterpillars on the dining room table and they were big as my thumb. And then we moved them into the guest bathroom and we sealed it off from the cats. And every day I'd go in there and just bring them more food. I spent $300 on milkweed plants that they just ate without a thought. Anyway, and then came the time, it's like, what is going to happen? And I didn't read up on anything. I thought, let's just go. Let's let it all be revealed. So then the next thing, there was this beautiful little jewel, this lime green little jewel hanging from a tip on the edge of the, of the terrarium. It was a chrysalis. And I just thought, well, how, how did that happen? Like, it's so small. Those worms are so big. Uh, how? And I kept missing the moment because you blink and that thing happens. It's like, it's a, it's a caterpillar. And then it's all, all of a sudden this little green and gold jewel. And so one morning I was, um, I was on my way to do something else, but it was like the spirit just nudged me like, go into the red bathroom, take your phone, sit down and just wait. And sure enough, um, a monarch caterpillar attaches itself by its end. It hangs upside down in a J and it just hangs there for maybe a day or two days and it becomes kind of discolored and you think it's going to die. And then I got to witness this transformation and I can't even explain to you. I don't know. Has anybody witnessed that? It's, it's a miracle. Like you can't believe your eyes. It's like a magic show going on. And, and it's like, it starts to do these little sit-ups, you know, these upside down sit-ups. And it's like, you see the, the, the um, whatever's inside of it is kind of being pushed up towards its tail end. And then all of a sudden, whatever's in there, this kind of green, shimmering green something, kind of comes out of its kind of where its neck would be if it had a neck. And, and it becomes like, it's almost like this little um, sleeping bag that's inside 
comes out and it encases the whole caterpillar and it starts being zipped up. So it's curling up and zipping up into its little cozy little green. And the magic show suddenly becomes a horror show because the last thing, it, it zips its way all the way up to that little place that it's dangling from. And then it decapitates itself. Now it did not see that coming that the head was not gonna go inside, but it was gonna lie down there like Marie Antoinette's head. Anyway, so that was so fascinating and I caught it on film and I just I just thought, wow. And then all of a sudden, within a, a span of a week, there were these beautiful jewels hanging all over from the faucet, um, from the toilet, paper dispenser from a towel everywhere we were just these jewels all over and then the anticipation of what was to come when were they going to come out and so it takes about 12 days 12 to 14 days and the little chrysalis the last two or three days starts to become more and more transparent and then eventually so transparent that you can see those wings and then then this wonderful thing happens this little gold seam around the top splits open and this beautiful monarch butterfly kind of flops out and gravity helps it pull the blood down and the wings are all crumpled in the beginning and then they just extend it just hangs there and all this work is being done for it and these beautiful long wings this this poochy little abdomen gets nice and long and elegant and within hours it's ready for us to open the windows for it to go out on its new journey. It's absolutely miraculous. For the longest time, the symbol for Christians was the butterfly, not the cross. It was the butterfly. Now, I used to long for God to speak to me in an audible voice. But then I realized, and now this is true, that God has embedded messages for us everywhere. In fact, right outside my door in my kind of untamed rocky garden, you take the monarch, right? So from a monarch's entire life, from the time that it's living in the soil to being in the sky, it's nothing if but a message from God. And here's the message. To exist is to be transformed. To exist is to experience resurrection. To have new life, and then to have more new life. Transformation, resurrection, and new life aren't just possible, they're inevitable. And not just for some, but for each of us. You will be transformed, you will be resurrected, you will have new life, and you will have more new life. Struggling is part of this whole code of life too. We are all too focused on that rightly so, but transformation is pretty shallow, if you think about it, without struggle. And what's the point of resurrection if there's no death? And new life is only possible through the mechanism of change. Change is the only constant, we all know that, even as we resist it, but what we don't remind each other often enough is the good news. Here it is, change can, and will lead to good things. Things that perhaps you dreamed about or things you were too scared to dream about or the good things that your parents or your beloved dreamt on and prayed for on your behalf. Good things are inevitable. The good news, capital G, capital N, is you don't have to work for it. You don't have to do one more thing to improve yourself. You don't even have to be good. God's blessing of transformation, it's coded into your life. The caterpillar did nothing to earn its wings. It did absolutely nothing to become an abiding symbol for us humans of beauty and hope. It ate. In fact, it gorged itself. And some, sometimes monarchs are so hungry and focused on what's in front of them that they will eat another monarch. 
Yeah, even those cannibals get to experience transformation. They get to have their wings. They get to sip nectar that they didn't make on flowers that they never imagined. Now, if you don't in believe that God intends this for you, you have not been paying attention to the Gospels because Jesus showed this in his life. He demonstrated it. He taught it in parables. He spelled it out. And then he demonstrated it when he died and went into that tomb. And then when he showed his splendid resurrected self to the woman who came to the tomb, to the disciples who were afraid, to a crowd even. Even death is not defeat, but rather a kind of chrysalis from which some spectacular new you is going to arise. God is speaking everywhere. Even the rocks cry out. And it's a loud and clear message. It's a reassurance. You are going to be okay. You're going to be more than okay. You are an intended and beloved unfolding work of truth. Though there is struggle and strife on the macro level and in our daily experience, we are embedded in a divine code, a complex pattern of love and goodness that is engineered, one, to benefit us, to be a kind of testimony to others who might be looking around, looking for hope, ultimately to reflect the incomprehensible glory, the blinding majesty of the one who has created us, the one to whom we each belong. Worms one day fly, people. Thank you, God, for this irrefutable witness. Thank you, God, for speaking. Amen.